Chapter 16 Thomas spent the morning with the keeper of the gardens, working his butt off, as Newt would have said. Zart was the tall, black-haired kid who'd stood at the front of the pole during Ben's banishment, and who for some odd reason smelled like sour milk. He didn't say much, but Thomas showed him, but showed Thomas the ropes until he could start working on his own. Weeding, pruning an apricot tree, planting squash and zucchini seeds, picking veggies. He didn't love it, and mostly ignored the other boys working alongside him, but he didn't hate it nearly as much as what he had done for Winston at the bloodhouse. Thomas and Zart were weeding a long row of young corn when Thomas decided it was a good time to start asking questions. This keeper seemed a lot more approachable. So Zart, he said. The keeper glanced up at him and resumed his work. The kid had droopy eyes and a long face. For some reason, he looked as bored as humanly possible. Yeah, Greeny, what you want? How many keepers total are there? Thomas asked, trying to act casual. And what are the job options? Well, you got the builders... The sloppers, baggers, cooks, map makers, medjacks, track hoes, bloodhousers, the runners, of course. I don't know, a few more, maybe. Pretty much keep to myself and my own stuff. Most of the words were self-explanatory, but Thomas wondered about a couple of them. What's a slopper? He knew that was what Chuck did, but the boy never wanted to talk about it. Refused to talk about it. That's what the shanks do when they can't do nothing else. Clean toilets, clean the showers, clean the kitchen, clean up the bloodhouse after a slaughter, everything. Spend one day with them suckers, they'll cure any thoughts of going that direction. I can tell you that. Thomas felt a pang of guilt over Chuck and felt sorry for him. The kid tried so hard to be everyone's friend, but no one seemed to like him or pay much attention to him. Yeah, he was a little excitable and talked too much, but Thomas was glad to have him around. What about the track hose? Thomas asked as he yanked out a huge weed, clump, clumps of dirt swaying on the root. Roots? Sorry. Zark cleared his throat and kept on working as he answered. They're the ones that take care of all the heavy stuff for the gardens, trenching and whatnot. During off times, they're, they do other stuff around the glade. Actually, a lot of gladers had more than one job. Anyone tell you that? Thomas ignored the question and moved on. Determined to get as many answers as possible. What about the baggers? I know they take care of dead people, but it can't happen that often, can it? There are creepy fellas. They act as guards and police, too. Everyone just calls them baggers. Have fun that day, brother. He snickered the first time. Thomas ever heard him do so. There was something li very likable about it. Thomas had more questions. Lots more. Chuck and everyone else around the glade never wanted to give him the answers to anything. And here was Zart, who seemed perfectly willing. But suddenly, Thomas didn't feel like talking anymore. For some reason, the girl had popped into his head again, out of the blue, and then thoughts of Ben. And the dead griever. Which should have been a good thing. But everyone acted as if it were anything but. His new life pretty much sucked. He drew a deep, long breath. Just work, he thought. And he did. By the time mid-afternoon arrived, Thomas was ready to collapse from exhaustion. All that bending over and crawling around on your knees in the dirt was all the pits. Bloodhouse, gardens, two strikes. Runner, he thought as he went on break. Just let me be a runner. Once again, he thought about how absurd it was that he wanted it so badly. But even though he didn't understand it or where it came from, the desire was undeniable. Just as strong were the thoughts of the girl, but he pushed them aside as much as possible. Tired and sore, he headed to the kitchen for a snack and some water. He could have eaten a full-blown meal despite having lunch two hours earlier. Even Pig was starting to sound good again. He bit into an apple, then plopped on the ground beside Chuck. Newt was there too, but sat alone, ignoring everybody. His eyes were bloodshot, his forehead creased with heavy lines. Thomas watched as Newt chewed his fingernails, something he hadn't seen the older boy do before. Chuck noticed and asked the question that was on Thomas's mind. What's wrong with him? The boy whispered. Looks like you did when you popped out of the box. I don't know, Thomas replied. Why don't you go ask him? I can hear every bloody word you guys are saying, Newt called in a loud voice. No wonder people hate sleeping next to you, Shanks. Thomas felt like he'd been caught stealing, but he was gen genuinely curious. Newt was one of the few people in the glade he actually liked. What is wrong with you, Chuck asked. No offense, but you look like Clunk. Every loving thing in the universe, he replied. 
then fell silent as he stared off into space for a long moment. Thomas almost pushed him with another question, but Newt finally continued. The girl from the box keeps growing and saying all kinds of weird stuff, but won't wake up. Medjacks are doing the best to feed her, but she isn't. But she's eating less each time. I'm telling you, something very bad about the whole bloody thing. Thomas looked down at his apple, then took a bite. It tasted sour now. He realized he was worried about the girl, concerned for her welfare, as if he knew her. Newt let out a long sigh. Shuck it, but that's not really what's got me bugging. Then what does, Thomas asked. Thomas leaned forward, so curious he was able to put the girl out of his mind. Newt's eyes narrowed as he looked to out towards one of the entrances to the maze. Albion and Minnow, he muttered. They should have come back hours ago. Before Thomas knew it, he was back at work, pulling weeds again, counting down the minutes until he'd be done with the gardens. He glanced constantly at the west door, looking for any sign of Albion and Minnow. Newt's concerns had been rubbed off on him. Newt had said they were supposed to have come back by noon, just enough time for them to go out to the dead griever, explore for an hour or two, and then return. No wonder he looked so upset. When Chuck offered up that maybe they were just exploring and having some fun, Newt had given him a stare so harsh Thomas thought Chuck might spontaneously combust. He'd never forget the next look that came over Newt's face. When Thomas asked why Newt and some of the others didn't just go out into the maze to search for their friends, Newt's expression had changed to outright horror. His cheeks had shrunk into his face, becoming shallow and dark. It gradually passed, and he explained that sending out search parties was forbidden, lest even more people be lost, but there was no mistaking the fear that had crossed his face. Newt was terrified of the maze. Whatever had happened out there, maybe even related to his lingering ankle injury, had been truly awful. Thomas tried not to think about it as he put his focus back into yanking weeds. That night, dinner pro proved to be a somber affair. It had nothing to do with the food. Fry pan and his cook served up a grand meal of steak, mashed potatoes, green beans, and hot rolls. Thomas was quickly learning that the jokes about fry pan's cooking were just that. Jokes. Everyone gobbled up his food and usually begged for more. But tonight, the gladers ate like dead men resurrected for one last meal before being sent to live with the devil. The runners had returned from at their normal time, and Thomas had grown more and more upset as he watched Newt run from the door to door as he entered the glade, not bothering to hide his panic. But Albie and Minnow never showed up. Newt forced the gladers to go on to get some of Fry Pan's hard-earned dinner, but he insisted on standing watch for the missing duo. No one said it, but Thomas knew it wouldn't be long before the doors closed. Thomas re reluctantly followed orders like the rest of the boys and was sharing a picnic table at the south side of the homestead with Chuck and Winston. He'd only been able to eat a few bites when he couldn't take it anymore. I can't stand... I can't stand sitting here while they're out missing, he said as he dropped his fork on his plate. I'm going to go over to watch the doors with Newt. He stood up, headed out to look. Not surprisingly, Chuck was right behind him. They found Newt at the west door pacing, running his hands through his hair. He looked up at Thomas. He looked up as Thomas and Chuck approached. Where are they? Newt said, his voice thin and strained. Thomas was touched that Newt cared so much about Albie and Minho, as if they were his own kin. Why don't we send out a search party? He suggested again. It seems so stupid to sit here and worry themselves to death when they could go out and find them. Bloody hell. Newt started before stopping himself. He closed his eyes for a second and took a deep breath. We can't, okay? Don't say it again. 100% against the rules, especially with the bugging doors about to close. But why? Thomas persisted, in disbelief at Newt's stubbornness. Won't the Grievers get them if they stay out there? Shouldn't we do something? Newt turned on him, his face flushed red, and his eyes flamed with fury. Shut your hole, Greeny, he yelled. Not a bloody week you've been here, and you think I wouldn't risk my life in a second to save those lugs? No, I... Sorry, I didn't mean... Thomas didn't know what to say. He was just trying to help. Newt's face, Newt's face softened. You don't get it yet, Tommy. Going out there at night is begging for death. We'd just be throwing more lives away. If those shanks don't make it back... He paused, seemingly hesitant, hesitant to say what everyone was thinking. Both of them swore an oath, just like I did. Just like we all did. 
You too, when you go to your first gathering and get chosen by a keeper, never go out at night, no matter what. Never. Thomas looked over at Chuck, who seemed pale faced as Newt. Newt won't say it, the boy said, so I will. If they're not back, it means they're dead. Minho's too smart to get lost. Impossible. They're dead. Newt said something, and Chuck turned and walked back towards the homestead, his head hanging low. Dead, Thomas thought. The situation had become so grave, he didn't know what, how to react, and felt a pit of emptiness in his heart. The shank's right, Newt said, solemnly. That's why we can't go out. We can't afford to make things bloody worse than they already are. He put his hands on Thomas, Thomas's shoulder, then let it slump to his side. Tears moistened Newt's eyes, and Thomas was sure that, within, that even within the dark chamber of memories that were locked away, out of his reach, he had never seen someone look so sad. The growing darkness of twilight was a perfect fit for how grim, how grim things felt to Thomas. The doors close in two minutes, Newt said, a statement of so succinct and final, it seemed to hang in the air like a burial shroud caught in a puff of wind. Then he walked away, hunched over and quiet. Thomas shook his head as he looked back into the maze. He barely knew Albie and Minho, but his chest ached at the thought of them out there killed by the horrendous creature he had seen through the window the first morning in the glade. A loud boom sounded from all directions, startling Thomas out of his thoughts. Then came the crunching, grinding sound of stone against stone. The doors were closing for the night. The right wall rumbled across the ground, spitting dirt and rocks as it moved. The vertical row of connecting rods, so many they seemed to reach the sky far above, slid towards their corresponding holes on the left wall, ready to seal shut until the morning. Once again, Thomas looked in awe as the massive moving wall, which defied all sense of physics, I'm sorry. Once again, Thomas looked in awe at the massive moving wall. It defied any sense of physics. It seemed impossible. Then a flicker of movement to his left caught his eyes. Something stirred inside the maze, down the long corridor in front of him. At first, a shot of panic raced through him. He stepped back, worried it might be a griever. But then two forms took shape, stumbling towards the alley, stumbling along the alley towards the door. His eyes finally focused through the initial blindness of fear, and he realized it was Minho, with one of Albie's arms draped across his shoulder, practically dragging the boy along behind him. Minho looked up, saw Thomas, who knew his eyes must be bulging out of his head. They got him, Minho shouted. His voice strangled and weak with exhaustion. Every step he took seemed like it could be his last. Thomas was so stunned by the turn of events it took a moment for him to act. Newt! He finally screamed, forcing his gaze away from Minnow and Albie to face the other direction. They're coming! I can see him. He knew he should run into the maze and help, but the rule about leaving the glade was seared into his mind. Newt had already made it back to the homestead, but at Thomas's cry, he immediately spun around and broke into a stuttering run toward the door. Thomas turned to look back into the maze, and dread washed through him. Albie had slipped out of Minho's clutches and fallen to the ground. Thomas watched as Minho tried desperately to get him back on his feet, then finally giving up, started to drag the boy across the stone floor by the arms, but they were still a few hundred feet away. The right wall was closing fast, seeming to quicken his paths, his pace towards the more... I'm sorry. The right wall was closing fast, seeming to quicken his pace, the more Thomas willed it to slow down. They were only seconds left until it shut completely. They had no chance of making it in time. No chance at all. Thomas turned to look at Newt, limping along as well as he could. He only made it halfway to Thomas. He looked back into the maze at the closing wall. Only a few feet more and it would be over. Minnow stumbled up ahead, fell to the ground. They weren't going to make it. Time was up. This was it. Thomas heard Newt scream something from behind him. Don't do it, Tommy. Don't you bloody do it. The rods on the right wall seemed to reach out like stretched arms for their home, grasping for those little holes that would serve as their resting place for the night. The crunching, grinding sound of the doors filled the air, deafening. Five feet, four feet, three, two. 
Thomas knew he had no choice. He moved. Forward. He squeezed past the connecting rods at the last second and stepped into the maze. The wall slammed shut behind him, the echo of its boom bouncing off the ivy-covered stone like mad laughter. <laughs>